opportunity uh, to present uh, a few things from my my work today. Um, whenever you have questions, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, of course, I prepared a few questions for you too, um, because I think um, you are yeah at the end of your your lab. Um, you learned a lot, and I think uh, a few questions make sense to sum up um, a lot of things, um, especially because um, I'm into the autonomous racing stuff since uh, two, two and a half years, and we started with the project RoboRace. Uh, first of all, I want to give you a short introduction about what RoboRace is. Um, RoboRace is coming from a company in England and they provided a, a race vehicle, an autonomous race vehicle you can see here. They built um, four vehicles in total and we were able to use this vehicle and develop software for this vehicle only. So the complete hardware side is done by RoboRace. And we developed the software only so the autonomous driving pipeline. Um, what's really interesting, it's a race car. Um, it's based on an LMP, Le Mans prototype. You probably know that from the Le Mans races. And it's really powerful, two electric engines with 135 kilowatt. It's, it's powerful, it's not like a Formula One car, of course, but it's really powerful. And what's most important about it is the, the hardware setup of the, of the vehicle. We have an NVIDIA Drive PX2 and a speed code as a main ECU low-level ECU, an OXTS, five LiDAR systems, a radar, and the camera and ultrasonic sensors. So basically, this is the, the setup. And this is the vehicle. You can, can see it here. And the first question I've, I've provided for you is from your experience um, in the 1 to 10th vehicle, what do you think is the, the best perception sensor for the racetrack? Perhaps you can just uh, answer it. So I cannot. Sorry, uh, I cannot uh, see your your the the answers. Probably um, because I I, I um, have the presentation mode. So probably you can just um, uh, yeah. Just speak it out. Speak it, yeah. Yeah, I think camera is more important, but then LiDAR, if you have good quality LiDARs, 3D LiDARs, then they are equally well good. Yes, this is a good answer. Um, the LiDAR is the best one here, and I tell you why. Because you can see the car is really low. It has a, a small height. And the camera positioning on the vehicle is here on the left side. And even if you put it on a screen here, what you normally know from a normal autonomous driving vehicle, you will see not far on the racetrack. You can see it here on the right picture that it's possible to check um, the road or the, the racetrack from the camera only, but you have a very bad perspective from um, the camera. So the best, the best usage here is um, the LiDAR system. We're using uh, a three-dimensional LiDAR um, from, the company, uh, um, from the company Ibeo. Perhaps you have heard from Melodyne or something like that. They are super expensive. Um, and this is a big problem for LiDARs. You learn from the lectures. Uh, if it's super expensive, but it's good in detection. And the second question I have for you is what do you think currently is the best localization method on the racetrack? Perhaps also what you learned from your lectures. I would guess the GPS. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, I, because I asked this question is, um, or the reason why I asked this question is, we're using a differential GPS here, and a differential GPS gives us a localization uh, accuracy of about six centimeters. We are always, when we are outside on the racetrack, um, we are always under, uh, under the, the, the clear sky, so we always have a really good connection. Um, you probably will see it here that the racetrack has not so much features. So we used LiDAR for um, LiDAR localization, the AMCL, um, which works quite good, but is not so reliable than a differential GPS. 
The problem here is the differential chip is super expensive and um, it's not real or it cannot be used in classic consumer cars. So the first things I wanted to, to share with you is that you always have to look what you can work with and what's the environment you're operating in because the racetrack environment is a very special environment that it's a little bit tricky and you have to deal with a few things that are not applicable to the normal roads. So this is the Robo Race competition. What we were doing in Robo Race, we were developing a complete software architecture, a complete software stack. And our goal, our main goal was to develop a software stack that is capable of planning a dynamic path and is racing the car at the limits of handling. This means we have to take care of the vehicle dynamics and drive as fast as possible. And to achieve this, when we started with the project two and a half years ago, we said we want to focus on a few things. And I think this is what Raul said um, a few minutes earlier. So you have to focus a little bit on the things you've got and the things you want to achieve. We said at first we want to reuse available tools and algorithms. So we don't want to reinvent like everything because there is a lot of um, work done before. So we were able to use ROS, we were able to use common simulation environments. So we use all this stuff. And what was also a very good working concept is that we focused on simple and reliable concepts. In the lecture, you learned about MPC and we will take a little bit, uh, or we, we go a little bit into, into the deep later about that. But we said MPC is a good approach and a promising approach but not for us, we want to rely on classic PID controller or PD controller. When it comes to racing, um, because five of my team members, including me, we had experience from motorsports before. Either it was from Formula Student or from an internship. Um, so we know when it comes to racing, we need an early integration testing and a maximum flexibility during testing. This is also very important. Um, always remember that when it comes to, to racing, not only autonomous driving. And then because it's autonomous driving, we need a wide variety of test cases. It's always when you develop something in the field, it's not only in autonomous driving, but it's special for autonomous driving. You develop something, you think it works, then you go to the testing and you find out it doesn't work in this case, it doesn't work in that case. You have an edge case here, you have an edge case there. And what helped us a lot were the field of simulation and continuous integration. And last but not least, um, it's not only an autonomous driving problem uh, thing, it's mainly a um, motorsport thing, is providing data visualization inside tools. You always have to be clear about um, the algorithm you developed and have an insight in the data you were creating. And last but not least, and this was the, the main part, what we were doing in Race, is integrating new algorithms for driving at the dynamic limits. And one of our goals was beating the human driver. And beating a human driver is possible, but is a really crucial task when it comes to not only a human driver, but more or less a race driver. Because these guys, they learned how to drive, they learned how to drive fast, and they can drive fast. And to achieve this with an autonomous system, is really, really difficult. So what we were doing, first of all, we had to look at the hardware. And I would recommend this to you when it comes to autonomous driving to have a detailed look on the hardware you get in your system. So in a one to 10th car, you're using the NVIDIA Tegra, um, sorry, the NVIDIA Jetson uh, with the Tegra chip. In the road car, we had the NVIDIA Drive Peaks 2. It's like the, the big brother of the Jetson. And an additional um, ECU we had were the so-called Speedcode mobile target machine. A similar um, product would be the DSpace Autobox, perhaps you've heard of that. And the first thing we have done, we discussed a lot about the architecture of our autonomous driving software. And we split it in the well-known parts, perception, planning, and control, because the NVIDIA Drive PX2 has two system on chips, the so-called SOCs, and they were into, combined, uh, they combined a GPU and a CPU. So we were able to put the perception part on one SOC, and we were able to put the planning part on the other SOC. 
So more or less, we could split the computation load on both e SOCs. And the control part, the, the, the last path matching and controlling and um, actuation part is completely done on another ECU. This gave us the possibility of the setup. If you have something different, you have to work out before and say, okay, which part do I want to have on which CPU to minimize the CPU load or GPU load at the end. The second thing, uh, what is always really important and people forget about that, is thinking about what you want to use or what kind of software language do you, do you want to use. In the perception part, we started with ROS first, um, 2018. Uh, in 2019, we switched to C++ and Python only. In the planning part, we're using completely Python. Um, Python is used by us because it's a um, really easy to learn programming language, and it provides a lot of open source data sets or a lot of open source um, software um, kits that you can use, um, packages, uh, which are really reliable in the field of autonomous driving. And MATLAB Simulink is used by us because the complete control part is done in Simulink, and so you have a model-based development. And the last part, which a lot of people don't talk about, but what is really important for us is an intercommunication of the different processes. And one of the reasons we were using Python is that we're using the ZeroMQ interface. Um, ZeroMQ is a special, special interface that builds up a socket and exchanges um, data on the Ethernet framework. And in addition, um, combining two different ECUs together, we were doing this with a UDP interface via Ethernet. And this is the complete setup we, we talked about first or where, where we had a lot of discussions and said, okay, how do we want to set up this framework? Uh, a question? Yes. Yeah. So uh, did you have to use Simulink because you went for DSpace controller or were there other benefits? for mm -hmm. going for MATLAB or yes. using DSpace essentially? Yes, exactly. This is exactly the right question. Why were we using Simulink? Um, Speedgoat is um, um, a company that's coming from MATLAB. So their complete pipeline is focusing on using a Simulink um, model, compiling it with their compiler and flashing it on a Speedgoat. This is point number one. And the second thing was that the model-based development in Simulink is really easy, really fast. And the third thing is that the data visualization and data aggregation and um, data exploration in Simulink with their project environment is super easy to use and fast. So this is the reason why we were choosing Simulink for the control area here on the speedcode side. Mm -hmm. I think for, for people in the class, the, the speed goat is pretty similar to the setup we have with the VESC. Um, you could yes. think of it that way. Yes, exactly, exactly, yeah. So what um, what makes speed goat so interesting is that they are real-time capable. Um, in contrast to the NVIDIA Drive PX2, which is Ubuntu-based, and it's, it's not really real-time capable, but the speed goat is. So with knowing what hardware we were using, we were able to set up a complete software environment for our autonomous race car. And what we have done, we developed each module you can see here, a gray box is a module, like an object detection module, a trajectory planning module, behavioral planning, the mapping process. I think that you are familiar with all of the um, boxes here, because these are the modules you need for autonomous driving, of course. And this is more or less um, a short introduction in the field of robberies and what we have done or where we started from and what was the main things we had to do to set up the software for the car. And today in this lecture, I want to go a little bit more into detail in this um, part here in the trajectory planning part. So you can see here two main boxes. One is called global race trajectory and local race trajectory. So 
What we <clears throat> figured out, and I think this is similar to what you're doing in your lecture, is that we need two different path planning algorithms or two different path planning approaches. The first one, we call it the global trajectory, more or less. This is the, the race line, the race line you are searching for. And then the global trajectory, you have a static environment. You plan the trajectory complete around the racetrack. So which means you may have the loop closure here. We have no moving objects or no objects on the track. And if, it, if there is an object, you include it in a static environment so you can plan it. You're searching for the fastest trajectory, of course, and you can do it primary offline. So you have one single execution, you find this fastest path and you're done. I say it here, primary offline, because there might be some incident on the racetrack, like saying there's a car crash and it's standing here on the racetrack and you have to replan your global optimize, uh, your global optimal path. Then you can execute it online too, but the main reason, or see the, the, the main approach we are using here is a single execution offline before. When you've done, done this, you're going to the second part, that's local, local trajectory planner. Now we have a dynamic environment, which means, yeah, we have moving objects in front of us. We have to plan a trajectory that's starting at the ego vehicle, we see it here, and it's just going for a fixed horizon. Let's see, let's say like 50 meters, 100 meters, 200 meters, something like that. We have to follow other vehicles. You learned this in your lecture too. And we have to overtake vehicles. And the main reason here is that we want to not only plan a fastest trajectory, we want to plan a safe trajectory, which means following other vehicles and overtaking other vehicles should Taken or is, is necessary to do it really safe so you're not crashing your car. And of course, this is done online only and you need real-time recalculation. So my next question for you is, what do you know, what are possible approaches or what kind of algorithms have you learned in your lecture for finding a race line? Perhaps you can tell me that. It's just a shorter, short reminder <laughs> for you. Okay, let's have one answer from each team as to what, what you all have for this question. Yeah, so the most recent one that I saw was Bayesian optimization for race lines. So mm -hmm. what they do is they like they they have a new coordinate system where they only have to search along one line at each point on the track about the center line so it's only one dimensional search and then they perform bayesian optimization to fit the gaussian model gaussian mixture model over each and then that's and then they go for a minimum time velocity profiling and they find the total time and choose the best one and perform the convex optimization okay so that um, Um, another one is uh, follow the gap. It's a reactive uh, planning algorithm, and it it gives us uh, a, a a a track through the largest gap that the lidar can find on on the circuit. Mm -hmm. Is there another team for with an answer? You could do some sort of uh, model predictive control that takes into account the dynamics of the car mm -hmm. as it's on the track and do um, an iteration for the entire track at once. Yeah, it's possible, yeah. So I'd, I'd just say on the, the follow the gap answer, is there really any guarantee of you know, optimality there? I think, uh, I think it's not because it's a reactive method, like a kind of reactive method and not a plan. Right. Mm -hmm. I see it the same way. 
I see the same way. So finding the gap um, is like more in reactive way. And this is, I think, the reason why I put these things here. Um, you plan a trajectory completely around the track. We have heard the answer of the MPC. And I would say the MPC um, is more or less a local planner. But if you do it completely around the track, what uh, one of you just said, then you may find the optimal race line because you're taking all the dynamics into account. Exactly. So, um, yeah, it was just like um, reminding yourself what kind of possibilities you have. And we using or we focusing on the approach of optimization. We have two um, approaches for the optimization. The first one we are calling the minimum, minimum curvature optimization. You see here on the right side, different race line um, findings or different uh, approaches to find the race line. You have here integrated the center line, which is the middle of the track. You have the shortest part optimization. You know it probably from the Dijkstra algorithm. You have the minimum curvature and the minimum time optimization. And you see different results in the lap time and different trajectories in the end. And the first one we are using is the minimum curvature pathfinding. So we give this algorithm an occupancy grid with a center line, so the inner and outer bounds. And then we're using a quadratic optimization problem. Um, the reason why we're using QP here is because it's very quick and very robust. This algorithm in its current state is finding an um, optimal minimum curvature for a racetrack in about 20 seconds. There's a discretization of about three meters you see here on a track. So it's really fast and it's really reliable and robust. We found this approach in a paper from an Italian author and we enhanced it in a few spaces like better curvature approximation, introduction of curvature constraints. You know, um, optimization problem is always um, consists of two main parts. First of all, the, um, the, the function you want to optimize, like minimize or maximize, and the constraints you enter. And we entered a few additional curvature constraints. And the third thing we were doing, we did an iterative invocation of the Q QP problem. So we um, executed once and we executed a second and a third time to find even a better result. And when we do this, this quadratic optimization problem, we get the path first and then we do a second calculation where we calculate the velocity profile with a forward backward solver. In this forward backward solver, we can integrate the maximum lateral acceleration and longitudinal acceleration our vehicle can drive. So more or less, we get an approximation of the vehicle dynamics with this part here. I have to say it's just an approximation, but with real measurements of the vehicle, it was able for us to figure out the maximum lateral and longitudinal accelerations on different velocities, and we could integrate it here so it can be used later. So this is the, the first optimization we're using. So can I ask a question? Yes, um, of course. So I may talk about this, and in that case, you can punt on it. But uh, we found that using the minimum time optimization, we can get very fast lap times, but they're dependent on the model being correct uh, when you execute them in the real world. Do you mm -hmm. think that there's advantage to posing it as a minimum, minimum curvature optimization problem rather than minimum time in terms of reducing the sensitivity of the solution to the vehicle's model? Um, so your question is, uh, again? So, so when we've done this exercise on the smaller cars, yes. uh, we've been using minimum time optimization. Yes. yes. And we find that the solution, when applying it in the real world, is quite sensitive to having the, the vehicle dynamics parameters very correct. Yes. Is it is it? In your experience, is it true that maybe using the minimum curvature objective rather than time would make the solution less sensitive? Because really, the thing that kills you is, yes, is yes, curvature. Yes. Uh, okay. with now, the model now I get, yes, now I get your, your, your question, and you're correct. Um, I really can um, 
uh, recommend you to read our second paper, uh, the minimum time optimization, because in this one, we were using once a single track model and a double track model for the vehicle dynamics. And we saw that with the minimum time optimization in the double track model, our lap time is getting much slower like two seconds, something like that, because we are now integrating vehicle constraints that may be uh, coming up when driving with the vehicle around the track, but may be not applied to the real world. So yes, the short answer is yes. <laughs> uh, question? Yes. So uh, can you explain a little bit more about what is minimum curvature optimization? Like, do you have only constraints on the maximum curvature or is it like integrated over time? Because when we try to do it, like it's like if you impose a maximum curvature optimization, it would just make straight lines and a uh, very sharp kink at one point to minimize the sum of like integration of the curvature. So how do you actually define your objective in this case? Okay, um, I can also, if I'm not sure if you have access to our paper, I would really, in case of the time, because I have a little bit more slides to do, I would recommend you our paper. I can send it afterwards to you or to Raul. And there you have the complete um, set, the complete definition of the, the goal function and all the constraints listed up. So you have it in, in detail there. And you don't need dynamics for minimum curvature optimization, do you? No, no, because it's integrated okay. here in the velocity calculation in the lat long accelerations limit afterwards. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, we we got a few questions there, and I would head back to the next one because the optimization tool we are using is not only um, the minimum curvature optimization. Now we are focusing on minimum time. And a minimum time is not a quadratic problem now, it's a nonlinear problem optimization. And the big change here, we, we had you had it heard in the discussion right now, is that we now can integrate the vehicle performance um, in form or as a single track or double track model to yeah, set up the or um, to integrate the complete vehicle dynamics of the car. And one thing I said to you or told you before is that our goal was to figuring out how to drive fast as possible around the racetrack. And fast as possible around the racetrack is knowing or there it's important to know the mu value of the racetrack. And I have a question for you now. I'm not sure or I'm not aware of how your knowledge in the field of vehicle dynamics is. But can someone of you just explain me what the mu value is for the for vehicle dynamics? Is it the coefficient of friction? Yes, it's the coefficient of friction. Um, can you just explain it? How it's it's made up? Um. I, my, my background's in computer engineering. <laughs> so no worries, I'm, no worries about that. <laughs> I cannot. <laughs> or do you know, do you know what influences do you have on the mu, mu value? Um, is it the slip, the tire slip? Um, it's not, it's not basically the tire slip, it's the tire itself. Like if you have like a, a slick tire with a, a, um, a, 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 the surface of the tire, then you have the surface of the track. And you have like weather influences, like if it's a dry track, an icy track, or something like this. So the, the mu value itself has a lot of influences in generating the value. And, and more, it also depends on the contact area of contact patch of the tires with the roads. And yes, yeah. exactly. So um, the reason is also to, to give you a little bit more insight in the field of, of motorsports is the reason why a Formula One car has so much aerodynamics on, on its vehicle is to generate more load on each tire. You can see it here in this picture. I've integrated the vehicle here um, in this box. And each tire is represented with one mu value. And the more load you give on one tire, the more 
um, force you can apply in a lateral um, in a lateral way. And this means the higher this value is, or the higher the load on the vehicle, the faster you can drive around the track. And this information is crucial. It's crucial for autonomous driving on a normal road because you want to detect if it's icy or slippy or rainy or something like that, because then you have to slow down your vehicle. And on the racetrack, this information is super crucial to drive as fast as possible because here in this value, they are there in, in this special value, they are lying the 5% for driving faster than the others. And this optimization number two gives us the possibility to integrate all these nonlinearities and to integrate a map of the track with all these mu values integrated in. It's difficult to derive these mu values in the first place, of course, but if you have it, then you can drive faster around a track because your here, your minimum time optimization path will change um, because of the mu values. Just imagine that you have here a slippy area, then your car will drive around the slippy area and drive another pass. So, uh, question. Yes. Uh, is this a part of global planner or the local planner? Because I see it would have more effect when you plan locally, because at that time you may have better information about the road conditions. Yes, um, we started with this one as the global trajectory planner, because then you have an influence on the, like say on the first, on the, on the trajectory, or first driving trajectory, on the, the big, the, the overall driving trajectory, but we are integrated this mu knowledge in the local trajectory planner too, because like you said, you have then more influence on a track if you know if there is a special area where you have to drive slower or you can drive even faster. But this is what I said before, you need to know this value here in advance or you have to derive it while driving on racetrack. And this is a crucial task um, where a lot of research is, um, is done in the last years to derive this value while driving. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. So now we have um, a global optimized or global path and we know how to follow this path or this is what we want to follow. So we get in trajectory and trajectory, I said before, is the combination of a path and a velocity and what we are sending out to the final actuation of the car is the curve linear distance, the coordinates x and y, the heading of the car, the curvature, and the velocity and acceleration. So these, is the, these are the information we always want to derive from our global and local path plan. So we know now this is the race line, the optimal race line, we can follow it. Now we're coming to the most interesting part, the local trajectory planner. And when you're thinking about setting up a local trajectory planner, you have to define your requirements first. So first of all, we think, thought about like, okay, what do we really need? Okay, we want to drive with a race car, so we have to drive on high speeds. You may find this trivial, but you will see at the end that this is one of the most important factors here. Because a lot of the algorithms you're finding today are not reliable on high speeds. Then we need to follow our race optimal line. Of course, um, we have set up now our global optimal line, so we want to follow it. So if you have an algorithm that is not capable of following this line or finding back to this line, it's not worth for integrating for us. Then we have to react to other vehicles in close vicinity, like we have to follow them or we have to dynamically overtake them because we don't know what they are doing. Then we have a semi-structured environment. So no lane marking, no specification. It's just some uh, uh, area of the racetrack where we can use. So nothing to rely on. And the last thing that we need a high planning horizon. So for us, um, it's not like capable or the algorithm is not capable to plan like just the next 10 meters and drive too fast because you have to think about that we are driving on high speeds. And if you have a low planning horizon, you're driving on those high speeds and you're missing a break point, then you will overshoot and you will crash the car. So this happened to us once. So we know that the recursive feasibility 
is really important driving on these high, high speeds. It's of course also important when planning your trajectory, but it's even more important than when you're driving on high speeds. So what we did first is like searching for algorithms that can do that. First of all, or yeah, there are a lot of algorithms um, in the field of path planning. Um, the sampling based um, methods are well known. You have learned about the RRT and so on. But for our requirements, that there are just a few left over that we can use. So first of all, it's the optimization approach again. I have integrated here the papers. Um, and they are listed up in the back. And if you're interested in, you can read them. From Ziegler and Williams is the optimization field. Um, the thing is in the optimization here, we found in these papers, they require a convex problem optimization. So our objective function for the optimization and the number of points we're using in this optimization problem, they have to lie in the same Euclidean area. So if you have a non-convex problem, you cannot solve it with this approach. In addition, an optimization is always, ha has always a heavy computation load. So it's computationally really expensive. But when you can solve this problem, you get a really smooth path with actually no discretization issues. So it's an, it's an interesting approach. You can use it for all requirements. The second one is the one-layer graph search. Um, I really can recommend the Verling paper from 2010. Um, Mr. Verling is uh, working now at BMW here in Munich. I, I know him. And it's a really good paper in the field of path planning for real-world vehicles on um, the, the highway. So Verling developed this for, for this special case. So more or less, we can not use it for complex maneuvers because the, the integration of lateral and longitudinal accelerations are splitted here. And we have just a, a small area where we can use this plan or path planner. In addition, um, it's relying that we are setting up lane markings or laneways. So the car is just switching from one lane to the other lane. So a complete super high dynamic overtaking maneuver is not possible here. But the one layer graph search is super robust and very fast. So it's also a really interesting algorithm here. And the last thing is the N layer graph search. So we extending now from one layer, you can see here, it's just like, one layer each to an N layer graph search. You can see it here. I will go more into detail in a few minutes, like from McNewton and Gu. And this algorithm um, gives us the possibility of complex maneuvers and the pre-computation of different parts. The problem here is the calculation time can be a little bit long and we have to think about the discretization of our complete graph. So more or less, these are the three approaches we have. We decided for this approach and we enhanced this for our usage. So I said um, be, um, before that we go a little bit more into detail with the MPC here. So perhaps one of you can tell me where do you see the MPC in this field? And perhaps you can just tell me what is the advantage and disadvantage of the MPC? I feel n layer graph search is similar to MPC, like if we perform it over as a receding horizon. Mm, not exactly. Not exactly. Uh, like, how is this graph created, first of all? Like, uh, how are the two nodes in different layers connected? Um, I will show that in a minute. <laughs> More or less, I wanted to say, um, or what I was aiming for is like that the MPC is more or less a complete optimization problem. So it's it's based in the field of optimization and you setting up um, an optimization problem with a goal to perhaps drive the fastest curvature. Um, we In the N-layer graph search, we will see a little bit later that we also do an optimization, 
but just for finding um, the, the, the last curvature at all. In addition, in the MPC, we have the complete model of the vehicle integrated. In the N layer graph search, we see that we can split up the path planning and the velocity planning itself again. And the disadvantage um, of the MPC, I think you, you learned it in your lecture, is that you also have the conflict that an optimization problem is really heavy in a computational load. So you need high performance um, uh, computation. And this is the reason why I told you before the hardware we were using. So the NVIDIA Drive PX2 is a, is a hardware um, that is really bad uh, when it comes to CPU load because it has an ARM CPU, which is really weak. So yes, this is the hardware we are working with, but it probably will not work on the requirements. We have like the high speeds and the high complexity we have with the MPC here. But it's just an additional um, input for you here. So we learned that we, in our approach, we were using the N-layer graph search, and we found out that the different approaches we already have in some papers are, are good, but are not the best one. So what we said, what we were doing in this N-layer graph search, we were splitting the spatial and the temporal planning. So again, we split it just the path planning and the velocity planning for our vehicle. The second part is that we sampling of realistic propass, like testing the feasibility and testing the collision checks of the vehicle. We have the possibility to split it in the offline and online phase, what is really good when it comes to autonomous racing, because you always have the test time, you have the, the knowledge of the racetrack before. And we were possible to integrate a set of trajectories, which means we split it up, a set of trajectories is going on the left side, overtaking left, overtaking on the right side and going straight. And just focusing on a set of trajectories that are interesting for us in a special case. So more or less, all the things are aiming towards to make the algorithm so as fast as possible to drive these high velocities at the end. So um, Raul will send you the paper and I think you can um, read the paper, but I will now show you a little bit more in detail and with a heavy graphics visualization, how this algorithm works at the end. We start here with the racetrack. You can see here the outer bounds and the inner bounds of the racetrack. We have here a big curve here, or a left curve here, a right curve here. And this map information is provided by us um, beforehand. You can do it with a mapping algorithm. You can do it by um, getting the GPS positions here of the inner and outer bounds. So whatever, um, it doesn't care for us. We need it more or less to like the, the X and Y coordinates of the track. And then we starting with the offline part. So we can do this on our computer only. We don't need the car for that. And the first thing, we have to generate the graph, the graph um, for the complete racetrack. So what we're doing is generate a state lattice. You can see here, we have now, here in this, this green circle, we have the, the center line, the reference line around the track, which is similar to our global optim, optimal path here. We have the state lattices here, and a graph consists of of nodes and edges. And the first thing we are doing, we're putting nodes here on these lattices. What is really good is that we can select the amount of nodes we want to have, and we can select the distance of the nodes. In our case, um, the distance of two nodes is 0 0.5 meter, so half, just half a meter. And with this one, we can, we can play a little bit, we can make it a little bit wider, we can make it a little bit smaller. Um, more or less, it um, leads to a higher computational time at the end. In the second part, um, we generate now the edges for our graph. So, which means that we generate a connection between two nodes on a lattice, uh, sorry, between two lattices, and each node is connected to the other nodes. We will see it here now in orange, one selected node, and he's generating splines to all of the other nodes here. 
This calculation is done by setting up cubic polynomials that are used to describe the C1 continuous transition between a pair of poses or between a pair of nodes you can see here. The formula for the, the cubic polynomials is listed here. This is the, the, the well-known uh, cubic formula with the um, coefficients a3, a2, a1 here. And we have the derivatives and the constraints for two consecutive nodes listed up here. And with these um, cubic spline formalization, we have the possibilities to generate the edges for our graph. The last part in this offline um, calculation is then to calculate the coast, which means that now each, um, each no edge here on our graph is getting a specific amount of coast. We have a coast formula set it up here. This coast formula consists of Ws, which gives us the weights for each of the performance values here. We have the average curvature on an edge. We have the delta curvature on an edge, which means the difference between the high and low. Uh, the highest and lowest curvature. And the most important thing here, the distance between an edge and the global optimal race line. So in this um, part here, in this factor here, you get the information about how far we are off the race line. And we write all of this with the distance of the lattice. So we scale it with the lengths um, of the path segment in order to allow a direct reallocation among the candidates. And all this stuff is done offline now to generate the complete graph for one racetrack. And with this information, we are capable to drive along this track and along the graph, of course. So now we have done the offline part. The graph is generated, um, so this code is written in Python. So you get at the end a pickle file with the graph integrated. The calculation, the offline calculation, to give you um, just a, a number, it takes about five to 10 minutes, um, depends uh, of course on the discretization, for this one and a half kilometer racetrack. So yes, it takes a little bit amount of time, but because we are in this race scenario, we have the possibility. So now we have done this before and we are now ready to drive on the racetrack. I set up the complete scenario here. We see the graph here. We see our vehicle in orange, our ego vehicle. From this point on, we are um, calculating our path. And we see here another vehicle because we want to drive in a dynamic maneuver. The first thing we get here is the object list about the other vehicles on the racetrack. And then the first thing we are doing is generating a so-called local node template. This means we are filtering the edges of the full graph based on the planning horizon. You can see it here. So we are just focusing from our ego vehicle on to the next 100 to 200 meters. And every, everything else on the graph, we don't look at. The second thing is that we are generating an action template, which means the driving straight, overtaking, and left. These are selected afterwards in our behavioral planner. But as you can see here, an object is placed on one of the lattices and is placed on different uh, edges here. So we gray it out and don't look at this area because an object is, is placed here. And we're focusing on a right action set template here in this field. And my question for you now, I, I hope you get the concept of it, is can you guess why we are filtering the graph, why we are doing the special part? Perhaps you have an idea of it. So that you can plan around the other car and you don't have to plan so far in the future as to lap around the track again. Mm -hmm. 
So can you imagine um, why we deleting um, this graph instead of just giving like an infinite weight on it or an infinite cost? Uh, maybe because that's a loop. If you get a infinite horizon, so yeah, gotta be a trouble because yeah, it's a loop. I mean, no. What do you mean with loop? Uh, so if you give a infinite horizon, that uh, you are trying to like to minimize the cost of the cost, mm -hmm. right? So okay, yeah, let's. Imagine that you take infinite time horizon to like to uh, to do the planning, but since it's a loop, so I will take maybe some time to mm -hmm. uh, go back to my point. Yeah, so yeah, this may be a problem. I think. Okay, it's going going exactly in the in the right direction, but it, it's a little bit easier. So okay. you can imagine by by filtering those edges. Um, that you give the advantage of a fast blocking detection, like saying just like you block this area with your result. So we can search faster. And the most important thing, imagine that if this vehicle is here with another vehicle, then we just gray out this area and do not recalculate or have to calculate or check where are these vehicles exactly by having the calculation of additional weights here. So we just don't look at it. And what also is really important is that by deleting such an area, we also deleting the nodes. And if one node is deleted, all the edges coming with this node are also deleted too. So you get a big um, increasement in the calculation time here in this field by filtering the action templates, uh, by filtering the, the graph. Uh, I had a question. Yes. So this is like the current position of the opponent car, right? Yes. And do we know exactly which nodes to delete? Like, because it may not be in our view. Um, so we have, yes. OK, good question. In in RoboRace, we will have the possibility to receive the actual vehicle position via and V2X environment. So. Mm -hmm we know the exact position in this field. If we just um, focusing on a perception of the vehicle, then you are right. We were not able to detect this here. Mm -hmm. And how beneficial is it to detect it, uh, like to remove its current position nodes? Because we know that when we reach there, those, those nodes are actually accessible to us. Like we can actually go there. So um, yes, so when the vehicle is passing these nodes, they were integrated again, and we can drive there. Okay, so it just takes the current position of the opponent vehicle yes. and plans. Yes, um, I um, go a little bit forward now. Um, this algorithm is running with 16 hertz. So we get an update of the current position. So we create this one here um, with 16 hertz in a second. OK, um, so now we have got our, our filtered graph. The next thing what is coming is that we are searching now for the shortest path. So this is the question we had before. Like, what is now our fastest or uh, shortest path around the track or in this special area here it's for us the shortest pass of course and we're doing it with a minimization um, optimization algorithm of course we are minimizing here this function this weight function because all of these edges have now a weight integrated and we're searching along the graph for the minimum weight of course we are aiming at the end for one node that's on the race line in the destination layer. Like we're searching for a node that's here in our horizon at the race line. You see here one special um, node. It's a virtual goal node. This was also not um, proposed by the other authors, but we are doing it. So since this node 
here at the last point on our actual racetrack. It might be occupied with an obstacle. Um, our goal is to find the next coast optimal node in this in this goal layer. And therefore, we integrated our our virtual goal node, and these virtual edges are used for a graph search only and do not belong to the resulting drive of the past. Um, the coast, as you say, aided with each of the virtual edges is weighted according to their offset to the race line. And that way, we have a preference toward the reference, reference line is set at the end. So it's just like a an, an supporting node for us here. Uh, isn't this a standard practice when we do Dijkstra or any graph search to accommodate for the terminal cost? Um, I'm not sure if it's a standard procession here in, in Dijkstra. For us in the field of the, uh, or sorry, in the in the papers we found, um, it was not done there in this field. Mm -hmm. I, I'm okay. not sure if it's uh, it's if it's normally in Dijkstra algorithm to do it like that, but more or less it's just like an additional thing for us to to find here to curve it, uh, fastest fastest and shortest path around this track. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have now. Our graph search is executed. We have a path here, the orange one. And now we have to calculate the, the spline, the final spline around this path. We are also doing this with a cubic polynomial equation. You can see here, you have seen it before. But now um, we are focusing on the C2 continu continuity. Therefore, the second derivatives must be integrated as, as constraints too. So more or less, it's the same approach as before when calculating the splines and offline part, but now with focusing on C2 derivative. Afterwards, we have now our drivable, sorry, not, we have now our pass. So which means the, the environmental drivable way in our local horizon. Then we calculate the velocity profile in addition. We can use our forward-backward solver approach from the global path planner. We were driving with this like for two years. Now we have developed a new approach. It's an optimization approach with a sequential quadratic program programming. We have the possibility to calculate the velocity by integrating the energy demands of the vehicle and by integrating vehicle dynamic approximations. Because of the things you have seen before, um, uh, uh, you have seen in the global path planner, the forward-backward solver just integrates the maximum lateral and longitudinal accelerations from the vehicle. So more or less, it's just an overall approximation of the vehicle dynamics. Integrating vehicle dynamics means we have to integrate a model. Integrating a model means we have to make our calculation much slower. And because we do not want to derive this, we integrate now this additional optimization approach by integrating the vehicle dynamic approximations like the mu value you have seen before. So a little bit more advanced than in a forward backward solver and a little bit more faster than a complete model setup. And now at the end of this online calculation, we have a path we can drive and a velocity we can try to follow. This information is now put in the vector I've showed you before, our trajectory vector, and is sent to our control part. This is done on the speed code side. And because I'm a little bit over time, I'm sorry for that. Um, I will just go there a little bit short time over that. Um, just to give you an idea that this is the, the control part of our vehicle. Um, we have split it in, in a path matching, uh, sorry, in a trajectory controller and a low level vehicle control, which means like matching the path of the vehicle here um, by measuring the lateral position in a PD controller. And we have a low level control, which calculates once the steering angle for the car and the force request, which means the acceleration or the braking force. So 
And to give you an idea how this looks like in the end, you see here our vehicle driving on the racetrack. When you see here on the left side, um, the additional online graph uh, calculation in the graph frame I have showed you um, in this lecture. So we'll see now here, the car is calculating its path because we have one vehicle in front. Now it's getting his path, knows that he can overtake the vehicle here and it's overtaking the vehicle. Exactly. Um, I will send you the presentation. You can watch this um, again and again if you want to. It's just a short graphic to show you uh, how it how it looks like in the end. So to sum it up in the results, um, it's possible for us with this approach to drive in any race scenario. So this includes the non-convex problems. The maximum velocity we reached with this approach were 223 kilometers per hour, which is really, really, really super fast because with the 16 Hertz update, you will get with this velocity around two meters, two and a half meters that you that your car will drive until you have calculated the next steps, which means two and a half meter is a really long space <laughs> by not knowing uh, what happens next. And this is one of the reasons why we crashed one of those cars because we missed like one of the breakpoints um, at 200 kilometers per hour. Missing a breakpoint was really crucial. Um, what really interesting is the maximum accelerations with this approach, where 15.8 um, meters uh, second squared, which is really fast, 1.5 G about. The average update rate is 16.8 Hertz on the NVIDIA Drive Peaks ARM processor. I, I write, wrote this down because you have to see that there is a difference on using it on the Intel i7. It nearly doubles the time. This is the reason what I said before, you have to take care of your hardware first because knowing the hardware you have is giving you the limitations of the algorithm you can use in the end. Like, yes, the MPC is a really good and promising approach, but putting it like on this uh, poor hardware will give you a lot of trouble at the end and not successful result. Um, to give you an idea, the lateral nodes were 0.5 meters on the, um, on the lattices and the layers are split into 30 meters on the straight and six meters in the curves. So you can see um, on the straight, you can put the lattices layer a little bit um, much more away and you do it a little bit nearer in the curves. Our planning horizon was 200 meter. And this approach gives us the possibility to follow another vehicle and to overtake another vehicle without any lane markings. We can underlie our time optimal global race line and it's working on automotive grade real-time real hardware. Once the speed goat and once the NVIDIA Drive Peaks 2, which is automotive grade. Also, it's really poor hardware, it's automotive grade. Um, still, this algorithm is not, uh, it's not solving all the problems of the world in autonomous driving. Um, it also has its challenges and its disadvantages. And one of them is the collision checking is computationally high demanding. So we need to set up or integrate parallelization. We have not done this before with something we are still working on. It takes a lot of time and it's, um, yeah, uh, not so, not so uh, funny to work on this because it's a necessary work to make it better, but not to make it uh, much faster. Um, if you insert further objects in the planning horizon, you will have a reduction in the update rate. You can imagine um, that taking um, care of a lot of more vehicle um, will increase the computation load. And of course, this algorithm depends or the dynamic overtaking in, in um, difficult scenarios like in front of a curve or after a curve in, in a corner is highly depending that you have a sophisticated dynamic prediction algorithms. And currently, we're not having something like that. So overtaking for us is more or less possible just on straight lines 
in a, yes, let's say, safe environment. So to sum it up, um, today I showed you our graph-based approach for low trajectory planner um, in the field of autonomous motorsports. Um, this algorithm can cope with race scenarios and requirements like high speeds. We can integrate the friction limit. We have semi-structured environment, which is really helpful there. We evaluated it on a real vehicle. So basically, we, we figured out that it works on these vehicles and it works on high velocities. And yes, future work is focusing on more sophisticated dynamical obstacle prediction and graph representation. So I'm at the end now uh, with my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I will uh, give her a really presentation and uh, all of you can have a look at it. These are the papers um, that are not our papers integrated. This is just one of them. These are the others. Um, perhaps you have the possibility to read of one of them. Um, yes.